Job declared in the word, he said, I know that my Redeemer lives. Everyone say, I know. I know. I know. I know. You don't sound like you know. I know, I know. My, Redeemer lives. my Redeemer lives. It is in Job, I think it's chapter 19. Can you turn in your Bibles to Can you put it up? Is it? Job. Is it chapter 19? Yeah? 1925. And I would like for us to read this and declare this out loud today. And just once I'm going to ask you to please stand with me. I want you to read it out really loud, okay? I don't mean just produce some noise or some sound, but really loud. I want you to read verse number 25, and we will read this verse together. Are you all there? Job 20, uh, 19, verse 25. Ready? Let's read. I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end, he will stand on the earth. I know that my Redeemer lives. This morning I want to ask you this question. You have heard that Jesus is alive. You have heard that he rose from the dead. You have heard that he died for your sins. You have heard that he works through his Holy Spirit in the world today. You have heard how he moves, how he heals the sick, how he raises the dead, how he delivers people. You have heard it all. But my question to you is, do you know that he's alive? That is my question to you this morning. Can you with confidence say, I know that my Redeemer lives? Can you say that with boldness? Can you say it as if you know it? Yes, I know that my Redeemer lives. Tell your neighbor, come on, tell your neighbor this morning. I know. I don't know about you, but I know that my Redeemer lives. <laughs> Hallelujah. You may go ahead and take your seats. Just a couple of days ago, we remembered the death of Jesus Christ. We remembered how he was crucified before that, before that, how he was arrested. We know the story of how he was flogged and for a few kilometers he had to carry the heavy cross on his back after having received floggings how he suffered till the mountain where his cross was lifted up and thrust into the ground and there Jesus spoke seven times and we've heard those seven sayings we've read it all and then in the end he declared what did he declare come on three words just three words what did he declare I wanted to shout it out. It is finished. And after that, he gave up the ghost and he died on the cross. You see, when we think about the crucifixion, there are several players that come to mind, several characters in the story. Can you name a few? Who all were involved in the in this event from Thursday to Friday. You had the chief priest, you had the temple priests, you had the soldiers, you had Pontius Pilate, you had Judas Iscariot, you have all these different characters, right? And these are the ones that come to mind. Herod, the king. But you know what? While these were all real and true people, that was not where the struggle was. That was not the real battle. That was not where the real fight or between whom the real fight took place. It was not these people who were the key players in this entire story. I want to paint a picture before you this morning. 
ever since Adam and Eve sinned and they fell from grace. Ever since that time, there's a line that has been drawn down through the ages. And it is on this line, or I'll go like this. This line is where stood an old rugged cross. On one side of the line was Satan himself with all his evil demons, all the devils, all the forces of darkness. They were on one side of the line. While on the other side was God, was Jesus himself and all the angels. They were going to engage in a battle. And that battle took place on Calvary. Why was this battle being fought? Believe it or not, this battle was being fought for you. It was being fought for me. It was to gain my soul. It was to gain possession of me as a prize that this battle was being fought. Even before that, if we look down through the pages of the Old Testament, we see how Satan himself, by the way, Satan was cast out from heaven. You want to read that portion with me? Let's turn. Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. If you turn with your Bibles with me. There's a description of how Satan, he fell, or rather he was cast out from heaven after he himself had sinned. The sin of pride. When you read this description, you will understand. Verse number 12. It says here, how you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You read his description. He was called the morning star. He was called the son of the dawn. These are the descriptions of Lucifer. You have been cast down to the earth. You who once laid low the nations, you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zephon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Do you see the number of times he says, I will, I will, I will. Statements of pride. And because of these statements and because of the desires in his heart, God said, I'm sorry, man. I had great plans for you. You were designed very, very exclusively. You want to read a small description of his design? Turn to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28, the second part of verse 12 onwards. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. This is describing Lucifer. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. Carnelian, chrysolite, and emerald, topaz, onyx, and jasper, lapis, lazuli, tarquil, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You... You were, you were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fairy stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God and I expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. Can you believe this to be a description of Lucifer? He was created very, very beautifully, very exclusively. 
If we study the word, we also read a description that every time he moved, his body would produce musical sounds. Beautiful music would come out from his body every time he moved. God created him exclusively and he was number two after the Godhead. And in spite of that, he just couldn't help himself. He wanted that number one position. And it was because of that, God had to cast him down. He said, you have no place in heaven. I will cast you down. And ever since he was cast down, he became enemy number one for God. And everything and everybody that belongs to God is enemy to Lucifer. And I want you, dear children of God, to understand and remember at all times uh, that even if something nice is happening to you, which is not God's will or God's purpose, it is only an enticement to grip you within his net and to destroy you. Remember Jesus' words. He said, the enemy comes only with a three-point agenda. What are those three points? He comes to steal, kill, destroy. That's all he does. He doesn't care one bit about you. And from the time of Eden, all the way down to the accountant Matthew, you will see time and again when he tried to destroy God's people. Every time, beginning from, uh, from Abraham, when God promised the seed, Satan tried to thwart God's plans and he influenced Abraham, who started to use his own understanding. And that's how Ishmael was born. But God said, no, it is my divine plan that you need to follow. And it will come only through me. And how from that time, Satan tried his best to destroy God's people. He did everything he could. When the Israelites were in bondage, every male child, two years and under, destroyed. If there are no males, there is no future. If there are no men, there are no children. And thus, that is the end of the nation of Israel. He tried that, but it didn't work. Because God, the sovereign Lord, who is still on the throne, he had everything in his control, and he was working out his plans. And his plans are never to destroy, but his plans are to prosper. His plans are for you to move forward. His plans are to grow you. His plans are to build you up. His plans are to establish you. It is too quiet in here. There's too much silence. Please respond <laughs> with an amen or a hallelujah or something. Keep going. And he kept doing that. Satan kept trying on and on. When you read down through the Old Testament, you will find time and again, he would either discourage his servants or try to kill his prophets. He would try to do everything. Till the day Jesus was born. And even the birth of Jesus Christ, he tried to destroy by giving an order through Herod, saying all male childs under the age of two, destroy, kill. But God, the sovereign Lord, protecting his precious child, protecting the future of mankind, protecting the great I am, he kept Jesus safe, again from the enemy. And then Jesus comes into the scene. He goes into the wilderness where the Spirit of God led him. 40 days. And even in those 40 days, Satan tries to disturb Jesus. And they engage in a small little battle. The tiny battle in the wilderness where Satan comes and he attacks Jesus at a point of weakness. What was that point of weakness? Hunger. Hunger. Obviously, after 40 days, he's hungry. He's weak. So Satan trying to be a hero, he comes and says, hey, you know what? Why don't you turn these stones into bread and satisfy your hunger? Thus causing Jesus to follow his suggestion. That's what Satan was trying to do. And today, he does the same with each one of us. He tries to plant within our minds. He tries to plant in our hearts ideas. Those ideas are never to prosper us. Those ideas, remember, it is a good thing to eat food. But that time for Jesus, it was not a good idea to listen to the enemy. When the enemy said, eat food. Jesus said, 
And this was the punch that Jesus gave. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Bam! That was a shot. <laughs> Satan was shook. He's saying, wow, what is this? So he said, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, Jesus. Wow. That was something I didn't know you could hit. All right. Well, <laughs> forget that. All right, come here, come here with me. Come. And then he says, he takes him to a mountain. And he says, you see all of this? You see all the kingdoms? You see all the lands, the regions? All of this, I will give you. Can you imagine the audacity of Satan? He is offering to Jesus something which already belongs to him. But he pretends and he says, I have the papers in my back pocket. I will give you these papers, the deed papers. I will sign it to you. Just worship me. <laughs> Jesus, he is physically weak, but man, spiritually, is he strong or what? He says, what did he say? It is written. What is written? Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and him alone shall thou serve them. Oh, that scripture was more powerful than the first one. <laughs> that got Satan really shook. He was staggering. <laughs> he was trying to understand the plans that Jesus had, the strategies that Jesus was using for this battle. He didn't know that the strategy of the word of God was going to be so strong and effective against him. Dear people of God, that is why it is written, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I will not sin against thee. I would encourage you, have the word of God in your heart, not in paper, not on the mobile phone, but in your heart. And that, you know, he was really blown down. He staggered back on his feet and <laughs> he didn't know what to do. He was trying to dig out his best weapons. Which weapon would bring Jesus down to his knees? He said, okay, Jesus used the weapon of the word. I will also use the word. So he says, hey, Jesus, come here, come here, come here. Come here. Yeah. And he made him stand. I can't stand on this, but <laughs> you made him stand. And he says, you know what? Why don't you jump down? Jump down from it. You, it, it, the word, the word says, you know, what does it say? Um, the word says he, he will, he will give, give. He will give his um, angels. He will give his angels. Oh, you hit me so hard. I can't even think clearly. <laughs> He will give his angels charge over you to keep you feet from stumbling. Why don't you jump down? The angels will come. <sighs> Very tempting. What did Jesus say? What was Jesus' response? Come on. Thou shalt not put the Lord thy God to test. And man, I cannot act that out. I'm already out of wind. But that blow just knocked Satan down so hard. He had to just tuck his tails between his feet and just scamper away. The Bible says that moment Satan left him and he went away and looked for an opportune time. That's just a little drama to keep you awake. But it is true. It is not a... <laughs> it is true. Jesus came time to offer his life as a sacrifice. Because remember, Jesus said, I have come to enjoy a good time with my disciples. I have come to heal the sick. I have come to raise the dead. Is that what Jesus said? Yes, no, maybe, maybe not. I got you confused. That's not what he said. He said, I have come. What did he say? I have come to lay down my life. That was the agenda that Jesus had when he left the cross of, uh, when he left the throne of heaven. The only purpose for Jesus coming into this world, my dear friends, was to die on the cross. That was his purpose. 
He came intentionally to die and you have heard several messages on why it was important for Jesus to leave heaven and come to this filthy, dark, corrupt, hatred-filled world. It was not a picnic for him here on earth. He did not have a good time and it certainly was not a picnic when he was on the cross. When he was on the cross, before that, he went through much physical torture. And soon the battle begins. Remember the line? The cross on the line. On one side, the forces of darkness. On the other side, Jesus and his angels. And soon Satan and Jesus engage in a battle. They have a fight. And like I said, the prize for the winner it is you. It is you. You were the prize. You were the reason why he engaged in this fight. It was you. It was me. He engaged in this fight. It was for man's soul. They fought for hours. Each one striking a blow that was better than the next. Soon, on Jesus' body, marks appeared as a result of that fight. Down, up from his head, down to his feet, marks appeared. Whenever Satan would strike him, thorns on his head, nails in his hands, a spear in his side, the whip lashes on his back, Satan. Those were his punches. On and on they went, hour after hour. And then, just as Jesus was victorious in the desert in the small battle, this was a bigger fight. He fought on and on, but he was turning out to be the winner. He was turning out to be the real champion. He was turning out to be the one who was on the winning side. And in triumphant declaration, he cried, it is finished and that was the final blow to Satan who fell down and as the word says you shall crush his head and that is what Jesus did he went and as he punched him he crushed the head of Satan on the cross of Calvary and there after that he called out to his father and he said into your hands I give up my spirit and he breathed his last he breathed his last you would think that when Jesus breathed his last, Satan thought, <laughs> he thinks he's the winner. He died. He's dead. I'm alive. Who's the winner here? So Friday night, after they crucified and after he died, Satan was busy organizing a party. He said, bring out, bring out all the, give me some names. Bring out the... Uh, Huh? <coughs> Not Jack Daniels. They don't know Jack Daniels. <laughs> Johnny Walker and uh, give me some names. I've never had these, so I don't know names. <laughs> but bring them out. Old rum and whiskey and let's celebrate tonight. We are going to celebrate the death of our enemy number one. Uh, we are going to have fun tonight. And so they were preparing for a feast. And Satan and all his demons, you know, they started dancing and whooping and all of that, you know, and one striking the other and just having fun. But Satan himself was a little uneasy. <laughs> There's a song by a songwriter who gives a description of what might have happened. The name, guy named Carmen, if you have heard the song, is very interesting. And while the party was going on, Satan took his crooked finger and he dialed the phone by his bed to call an old faithful friend whose name was Death, saying to be sure whether he was dead. He said, hey, grave, is he alive? I don't want to lose my reputation. So grave just laughs, says, the fellow is dead like a nail. Don't worry, man, go enjoy your party. And so they continued with the party and everyone was going, but Satan was still uneasy. So after a few minutes, he again calls up the grave, the grave complains, say, what man, why don't you go to sleep? Let me sleep at least, you know, it's been a rough day for me, I want to sleep and you don't disturb me. 
Satan says, you know what, I'm very uneasy. You remember when Lazarus was dead? <laughs> you remember how Jesus, he went to the grave and he just called out Lazarus and boom, he was raised. <laughs> now this Jesus, he's more trouble for me because Lazarus took four days and this guy is saying he'll be dead in three. That's a bigger challenge for me. <laughs> so Satan says, you know what, you, you're just disturbing me. Go take another extra bottle of booze and go and lie down and do whatever you do, you know, but just leave me alone. And I'll catch you later. I'll catch you later. I'll catch you. Ooh. Ooh. Something's happening there. But we'll come to that. <laughs> When the battle is over, you know, Jesus, he dealt his final blow to Satan and he cried out. Can we all cry out? I have not built up a momentum, but can we cry out, it is finished? Can we do that? Ready? One, two, go. One more time. It is finished. One more time. It is finished. What is finished? The work that Jesus came to accomplish on the cross. Uh, he first of all conquered sin. Uh, he conquered death. He conquered hell. Uh, and he took over lordship of these evils uh, that Satan had temporarily taken. And the Bible says in the book of Revelation, Jesus himself declares, he said, I was dead, but now I'm alive. Behold, uh, I, have, I have the keys of... Tell me, the keys of... Death and Hades in my hands. What did he do? When he went down to Sheol, when this guy thought that Jesus was dead as a nail, he comes along. Where is a mic stand when you need one? It's not here. Anyway, <laughs> he comes and he grabs Satan by the neck. He says, you know what? You thought I was dead. <laughs> you thought I was dead. <laughs> But you must remember, I am on the winning side because anyone who is on Jehovah's side is on the winning side. And the same goes for God. He said, if my God is for me, then who can be against me? And so, you know what? You have been playing with these keys for a long time. Here, give me that. These were never yours in the first place and now onwards these shall never be yours. These keys are going to be in my hands. I am going to be in charge of death and I am going to be in charge of Sheol. And it says in the book of Colossians chapter 2, you don't need to open it, just have it displayed on the screen. But Colossians chapter 2, verse number 15 I think it says, Verse number 14, what does it say? Thank you. No, 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 no. I know, no, no, Colossians. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, Varghese, wrong verse. Verse number 15, yes. It says, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them through the cross and what Jesus did when he went down to Sheol, uh, he took hold of Satan and his demonic uh, forces were behind him and he marched uh, just as a victorious general in the Roman army would parade uh, all the slaves and all the soldiers that he had conquered. He would, that's what Jesus did. He triumphed over them and he made an open spectacle of them. You know what the Hindi Bible says? Kullam kulla tamasha banaya unka. That's what the Hindi Bible says. Kullam kulla. Tamasha Banaya, Colossians chapter 2 verse 15. And that's what Jesus did in Sheol. And then after that, after he took the keys of death and Hades, he told Satan, it's not over yet. This is not over. This is not over. Because you know what? I have another secret. You did not know this secret. I have another secret. And you know who that secret is? And Satan was listening with his partially open ears. 
because Jesus had boxed them in really well, you know. So he was partially deaf. So Satan is trying to, yeah, tell me. He said, my secret is the church. You're not convinced. You're not convinced. Yeah, that's the problem. We are not convinced because we don't know. And it is because of ignorance that we land in half the problems that we land because of ignorance. The church of Jesus Christ on this earth was supposed to be Christ's primary weapon against the works of the enemy. It is the church that is his weapon. And he told Satan that. He said, I will build my church. And you know what? Hum dekh lenge. The gates of hell shall never prevail against me. Narak ke fata kabhi bhi prabal nahi honge. Karke dekh lo, jo karna hai, dikhao. Bring on whatever you have. Let me see what, I, what you have. I will build and the gates of hell shall never, never prevail against it. That was Jesus' declaration. There were two things that Jesus did when he was in Sheol. One, he snatched the keys. The second thing that he did was he released the souls of the righteous dead. Right from Adam's time till that time. All the righteous dead were in that place. And Jesus released them. And he was going to take them with him. Open to Ephesians. Please display Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse number 8, it says, this is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. He took many captives. Who were these captives? These were the captives, the righteous dead who were in Sheol. He took them in procession along with his sacrifice. He was now going to go to the Father. And it was on his way to the Father that he met Mary in the garden. And Mary was going to come down and touch Jesus' feet. And Jesus said, don't touch me. Why did he say that? Because if you study the laws, the Levitical laws, whenever the priest would carry the sacrifice and the blood into the altar, no human was allowed to touch the priest or the sacrifice. No human being was allowed to touch. And so Jesus, he never canceled what was. He was following the same thing, but this time it was a sacrifice that was one and only once and for all. The only sacrifice that was needed, his own self and his own blood. And he was on his way to the Father. He just stopped for a few seconds to say hi to Mary. Just to let her know, you know what? I'm alive, I'm okay, I'm well, don't worry. But don't touch me. Because I have the sacrifice, I have the blood. I'm going to offer it to the Father. And if he accepts the sacrifice, then you know what? You have the victory because I have the victory. Because I have been made victorious. And so then Jesus continued his journey onwards. He went up to the Father. And I can imagine as Jesus entered, the Father who was seated, he stood up. He rose up and he was welcoming Jesus. He said, my son, well done. I am pleased with you. You are my beloved and you have offered your life. You have offered your blood. I receive that and I accept the sacrifice that you have offered. Now onwards, there is no sacrifice that is needed for the remission of man's sin because your blood will make them whole. Your blood will deliver them. Your blood will set them free. Your blood will break the curse of sin upon them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he said, come my son, sit at my right hand. And the word of God says, Jesus sat at the right hand of God the Father. The resurrection was made possible by God the Father through the creative and the powerful agent known as the Holy Spirit. And it is this Holy Spirit that Jesus promised and he sent to the church. My dear friends, the resurrection of Jesus Christ 
is an event that history can never deny. The death of Jesus Christ can never be denied by anybody. Neither can the resurrection of Jesus Christ be denied in history because it is an established fact. The disciples and the apostles who wrote the word said, our eyes have seen, our hands have touched and handled. We have seen the risen Lord and hundreds of people were witness to the resurrected Jesus before he ascended to the heavens when he said, I shall come back. I will come back to you. That is the risen Lord that we serve. From the depths of the grave to the heights of the heavens, he marched on where he presented himself to the Father. Hallelujah. There was much rejoicing in heaven. And Jesus Christ, after that, for 40 days, he kept coming back. He kept appearing to his disciples, encouraging them, empowering them, anointing them. Dear friends, the death of Jesus Christ is irrefutable. Even more irrefutable is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is undeniable. You ask me how I know he lives. Do you know he lives? That's why I asked you this question. Can you confidently say, I know. Do you know? Do you know? How do you know? How do you know? Your answer should be, I know because he's living right here. I know because he is in me. The moment I invited him into my life, I know that he is resident in my life. Dear people of God, this is what sets us apart from the rest of the world. We have a risen savior who is in the world today through his church, through his people. And it is the resurrection power of Jesus Christ which is working within us. It is that resurrection that resurrects things within our lives that were dead, that were hopeless, that were gone, that were better. He resurrects them to life because this risen Lord and Savior, Jesus is the only one. He is the only one. He is the only one who came back to life from the death. And he says, oh grave, where is your sting? Oh death, oh sorry, oh death, where is your sting? Oh grave, where is your victory? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory. Who won the victory? It was Jesus who won the victory. But then because he won the victory, he says, uh, the word says, uh, we have the victory because of and through the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Because of him, we have the victory. And things don't end there, my dear friends. This is not our Christian faith alone. This is only half of it. The remaining portion is the hope that we have. Jesus left us with a hope. He gave us a hope. He said, I am going, but I will come again. And this time when I come, I will come to take you with me. That's what he said, right? The first time he came, he was riding on a donkey or the colt of a donkey. But the next time that he comes, uh, he's going to come uh, riding on a horse. Uh, the horse symbolizes battle. It symbolizes victory. It symbolizes a king. Uh, and this time he is going to come riding on a horse. The first time he came as a lamb uh, to be sacrificed. Uh, but now he's going to come as who? He's going to come as who? He's going to come as the Lion of Judah. No more lamb. No more timid business. He is going to mean business. He is going to carry out business. He is coming as the Lion of Judah. He is coming back to take and to redeem and to deliver his people. I know my Redeemer lives. Do you know it? You know, there's coming a day. There's coming a day when this king is going to come to this earth. A day is coming when the marketplace is going to be empty. There's not going to be any more traffic in the streets. All the builders and the factories are going to shut down. There's no more time to harvest wheat. Busy housewives, they're going to seize their labor. In the courtroom, there's not going to be any more debates. You know why? 
Because the eternal king, the glorious Lord, the God of all gods, the God of the ages is going to come. Just as we read in Psalm number 24. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, so that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty the Lord mighty in battle he is the king of glory that is going to come and he is going to come back to take you and to take me would you all stand with me please and when he takes us with him happy faces are going to line the hallways those whose lives have been redeemed broken homes that he has mended, those from prison whom he has set free, little children and the aged, hand in hand they will stand, those who were crippled, those who were broken and ruined, those who were lame and blind, now they're going to be standing in garments of white, lining up the hallways. You will hear the chariots rumble, you will see the marching throng, the flurry of God's trumpets you're going to hear when it spells the end of sin and evil. Heaven choir is going to stand up and they are going to sing the song of the ages the song that says amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me you know this is one song that even the angels cannot sing did you know that the angels cannot sing this song because they do not know what it means to be redeemed they were not delivered they didn't need to be delivered they didn't need grace. We needed grace. So they can never sing the song Amazing Grace. But the choirs in heaven, they are going to sing it for us. When we march in through the hallways, they are going to stand up and sing Amazing Grace. Oh yes, the king is going to be coming. That is the blessed hope that we have because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That glorious hope that we shall see Jesus face to face and we shall be with him. He is coming to take us home to be with him. And you know the best part? Not only are we just going to be with him, we are going to be like him. Oh, hallelujah. We are going to be like him. Dear friends, if the resurrection of Jesus Christ was just a myth and not a true event, then like Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians, our preaching is empty and our faith is in vain. Verse number 17, if Christ is not risen, then your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. But verse number 20, Paul declares, but now Christ is risen from the dead. All the apostles and the witnesses, they saw it. They all rejoice and today we rejoice. A lot of Christians believe that because they are born into a Christian home or they have a Christian name, they are bound for the promised land. But you know what? That's not going to be true. Many people think that because they go to church, they pay their tithes and their offerings, or their name is written in the register of the church, they're going to go to heaven. Dear people of God, it, is not, it does not matter whether your name is written in the register of the church. It doesn't matter. It may be written and you may still be bound on a one-way ticket to hell. It doesn't matter if the priest will give you his blessings and say, oh, you go in peace. You have given, wow, 10,000 rupees. Oh my goodness. Yeah, there's a reserved place for you in heaven. None of this is going to ensure you a place in heaven. It is only a living and a loving relationship. Sonny, can you come up? With this loving father who sent his loving son, Jesus Christ, to redeem us. It is that relationship with this Jesus that is the only thing that is going to ensure that you are part of that procession that is going to take place leading you up to heaven. It is only that living relationship. Jesus himself said it. He said, many will come in that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not heal the sick? Did we not raise the dead? Did we not do blah, 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 blah? Jesus will say, yes, that is true. For me, it is all blah, 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 blah. That's all it is because I do not know you. I do not know you. You may have been sitting in AG Church for 20 years. I don't know you. I don't know you. The only ones 
whom Jesus knows are the ones who do the will of the Father, the ones who carry out the desires of the Father's heart. Those are the ones that are going to go to heaven. And this morning, while we did confess, I know my Redeemer lives. This is the question I want to leave you with. Do you know that you are going to be part of that procession? Do you know that you are going to be part of that throng that is going to line up the hallways of heaven? Think about it for a minute as we bring the service to a close. This message was meant to inspire and excite you because of today, but more than that, it is meant to challenge your conviction. Challenge yourself asking, am I going to be in that crowd? Am I going to be part of that procession? Shall we close our eyes? We are going to take the offering in a few minutes, so please do not leave before that. But before that, just let us reflect on what we just heard. Every eye closed, nobody looking around here and there. God send His Son They call Him Jesus He came to love Heal and forgive He died to Savior lives because He lives. I can face tomorrow because He lives. All my fears.
Let's give the Lord a hand of praise this morning. Oh, yes. I know. I know. I know. Thank you, Jesus. You'll be seated for a few minutes as we worship the Lord with our gifts of offerings and his tithe as we return to him. We praise God for the victory we have in Jesus Christ. Because he lives, we too shall live. How long are we going to live? As long as he lives. And how long is he going to live? Forever. And ever. And ever. And ever. And no end. Because he lives, you will live. We are not that dying kind. Are we? we are the living kind. Nobody could put Jesus into death. It's not the soldiers. It's not the Jewish leaders. It's not Pilate. It's not the... The, the, the soldiers who are hammering him onto the cross with the huge nails and hammer. But the Bible declares it pleased God to bruise them. Simply because of the extent of his love reaching out to you. His love. His love put him on the cross. His love kept him on the cross. Jesus would not quit simply because of you.